So, as Pam kindly introduced me, I'm director of something called Virtual Futures. And Virtual Futures was a uh, cyber culture conference here at the University of Warwick in the mid 90s. It ran from 1994. Uh, through to uh, 95 and 96. It was the, one of the largest gatherings of individuals interested in this idea of cyber culture. And it was unlike any other stuffy academic conference because it had uh, artists coming together with technologists and designers. There really hasn't been anything like it since. I think the, um, this was uh, from the Times Higher Education, but it was described by The Guardian as the Glastonbury of cyberculture. And in 2011, I revived that conference where I was lucky enough to meet the panelists who are sitting with us today to talk about this topic of human enhancement and what it means to uh, build a future human or perhaps future humans because as Kevin perhaps shared, uh, perhaps as a plural, we may not be all enhancing ourselves in the same ways. So I am very blessed to have um, an array of panelists with me today, both alumni um, from virtual Futures, uh, individuals who are uh, new to the university. In fact, it's uh, Nigel's first, actually first time in a university, but, yeah, apart from running drunk across uh, the, the campus of Cambridge. Yeah. Of Cambridge. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and you may run drunk across the lawns of Warwick later, if you like. Um, so what I'd like to first do is introduce my first panelist, uh, Professor Andy Mia, who's uh, now at the University of Salford um, in Future Media. And Andy, you've really been at the forefront of this, this idea of human enhancement, but with this specific uh, slant with bioethics. You've been very interested in ethically what does it mean to enhance, and, and your work's really explored um, some of the everyday cyborgs such as those you saw and studied at the 2012 London Olympics. Yeah, and I got into this subject through sport. So I was working as an undergraduate in sports science and did a PhD in bioethics and sport. And it was at the time when the Human Genome Project was just beginning to wrap <coughs> up. In 1998, New Scientist magazine published what I think was the first article to talk about the concept of there being a performance gene, the possibility of isolating genes that had specific functions that could allow not just athletes, but people generally to select for those characteristics and optimize their performance or their everyday functionality. And for over a century, sports have been a, a test bed for all kinds of modifications, legal or otherwise. And it continues today, not just through those examples of, of drug taking and doping that we see in the, in the news, but actually below the surface, there's a range of ways in which athletes are modifying themselves, some of which uh, people have never even heard of. And I think what's interesting within that community is the desire to transcend. And sports are predicated, I think, on that value that what we like about elite sports is the possibility that they are showing us the limits of human capabilities and going even <laughs> further. And that appeal, both from the practice community, but I think also from the spectators, is partly what the debates about human enhancement are all about. This excitement we have to know about our limits and the possibility of transcending them. And in 2012, the first time um, when um, we see this watershed moment uh, where the Paralympic Games begins to overshadow the Olympic Games. The first Olympic Games where an athlete with a prosthetic device competed in the Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games. He's not doing so well right now, yeah. <laughs> this individual, but, but I hear he's coming out soon, so <laughs> make what you will of that. But the point was that in this moment, we had this watershed moment where people who previously have been characterized as people with disabilities, you hear this term disability sport, now have the means by which to challenge the capacity of their biological counterparts and, of course, potentially or inevitably transcend it. And I think that's a really exciting moment and it's also a very provocative moment, but I think it's also at the heart of this entire subject where we've seen lots of debates about the distinction between therapy and enhancement and increasingly, the act of repair comes along with the possibility of going beyond what is both normal for an individual, but also as a species. And it's that transition from just becoming well through technology to becoming better than well 
that I think is at the heart of this. And on this panel, and it's something for you as audience members to think about, is what sort of better than well enhancements would you perhaps individually like? I'd like to bring Dr. John Pickering, who's um, here at the University of Warwick in the uh, psychology department, who's very focused um, on work around the brain and enhancement with, with regards to the brain and the body and equally the singularity. So if you could introduce us to some of the subjects that you work with, John. And I know there's some slides as well. I, I don't think I'll use the slides. Uh, they, they can come later. But can everybody hear me? Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't talk too loud. Um, Luke's introduction is, is very kind. Um, I still teach in the psychology department, but I retired quite a while ago, but sort of still hang around to keep my um, university reg reg registration still open so I can use the library's <laughs> resources. But I, I, I teach in the, in the first year. I tell them all sorts of stuff. I feel, I feel very relaxed and completely demob happy. <laughs> <laughs> this is academic therapy. This is, is everybody else okay? It's great. I mean, I, I tell them that most of what they're going to hear is, is um, well, I use a technical term, nonsense. Uh, <laughs> so much of psychology is, is um, really about itself. And it's not about the lives we really live. And th the reason I became involved in virtual futures uh, all, all those years ago, I hate to think how many years ago. How many years ago was it? 21. Hey! Okay. Um, <laughs> was because I've always been interested in how the human mind, the human mind, becomes what it is. Uh, we, we don't come fully formed, obviously. We have an a, a extraordinarily long period of development, which is not just physical, obviously, but, but mental, and it's, it's within a culture. And I became interested in the appearance within that culture of all the technological wonders that we're, we're celebrating today. And uh, I particularly became aware of how much it changed my practice as uh, an academic. It made it possible for me to do things in lectures and to have a different relationship with, with students, um, a more equal relationship, where I would give a lecture about something and I would say, well, I've found these, these books to read and these articles to read and uh, I've put them online. Um, you, you, can, uh, you, you can access them very easily, but you, you may be able to find things that, that are relevant uh, that I don't know about yet. So please act as scouts and, and go out on, on the internet, not just sort of looking around in the libraries as they would normally. Um, and, and that really excited me. And I thought, well, that's going, to, that's going to drop down the age scale to, um, to, to become the norm for um, very young children. And now we see kids as young as five and six um, happily playing with their, their cell net phones. So I suppose I'm here because the, the, the shaping of a new human being through direct intervention in, in, the, in the body, I'm highly skeptical about that, despite uh, Kevin's uh, in, engaging presentation, which are, which are always fun. Um, I think things are more important than that. I think that the, the, the building of the human for the, for the future will, uh, be the, the, will continue to make human beings in the way we've, we've always made human beings. It's much more fun than technology. And it sort of comes naturally. But surrounding that process of producing new human beings uh, is going to be a technological envelope of the sort of things that, that we're going to talk about today, and that's what interests me. And I've got plenty more to say about it, but perhaps I'll... Uh, I mean, that's why, that's why I'm here. And I'm looking forward to, to hearing voices from, from the audience and, uh, and the discussion, as opposed to uh, 
uh, just a sage on the stage um, holding forth. So I'll stop it there. Fantastic. So if you come to the University of Warwick, your library card works for as long as you need it to. <laughs> um, I and talking of as long as you need it to, sitting to my sitting to my right is uh, a, a friend and a long-term collaborator, and also the the original co-founder of Virtual Futures back in the mid '90s. It's amazing the university let you back down. Um, <laughs> Especially with the Telegraph outside. It's amazing that the university let you back. Dan, you have a very, since your time here in the mid-90s, and perhaps you could talk a little about the culture here at Warwick in the mid-90s, but since that point and since your time here, it's really guided your thinking around this idea of the future human, but with a very specific focus on, on AI. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Um, <clears throat> I came to Warwick in 1991 to study English and American literature, and I was in the English department. And um, I discovered really quickly that although I have a great passion for literature, and that's what I do now for a day job, that I teach literature, actually what was happening in the philosophy department was really much more interesting than anything that was mm -hmm. happening in the English department. So I ended up doing two degrees, really, a sort of stealing one degree on the quiet. <laughs> attending all the philosophy lectures, although I wasn't really supposed to be there, and then finally organizing these virtual futures conferences, which were basically about philosophy of technology. And that's guided my research ever since. My research is in philosophy of technology, whereas I teach English literature. And if I, if I talk, um, shall I talk a little bit about kind of what, what, what that research involves? Because it follows on very nicely from what John was saying, I, I'm interested in the history of technology and the evolution of technology. And I'm interested in the idea that humans have, um, have always really been enhancing themselves, even though they didn't know that that was what they were doing. So I like to put the debate about human enhancement in the frame of, in an historical frame. And these are John's slides. Um, of course. But they can make your point. Uh -huh, right, okay. Well, uh, not that adaptable. Not that fast. Um, I want to point out that a couple of hundred years ago, uh, scientists, as they were then, used to think that if you could make something, you could understand it. So this was a duck made by a chap called Jacques de Vaucanson, and it's a mechanical duck. And um, it works as a duck. It does all the things ducks do, or two of the things ducks do. It eats, and it digests. And you can see that little arrow down there where the product of the digestion would come out. Now, um, nowadays, we don't think this way. We think that knowledge is a means to making. We think, how can you possibly make something? unless you first understand it. So, for example, how can we make artificial intelligence if we don't really fully understand what intelligence is? How can we make sarcasm if we don't really understand what sarcasm is? And of course, neither of those two poles are quite true. We often make things without understanding them, and we often understand things through making them. And I wanted to show you, um, to begin, one of the earliest technologies this is man making a thing, and the thing he's making is fire. And the way he's making it is he's holding a stick in his hands, and he's got a block underneath with tinder in it, and he's rubbing his hands back and forth so that the stick rotates very fast and creates tinder, that, uh, that creates friction with the tinder, and eventually you get fire. And, of course, this machine became refined eventually. The second version of the machine, as we know from archaeologists, had a bow and a string. So you wouldn't rub your hands anymore. You'd make a movement like this, and string would twirl up and down the stick. And after twirling up and down the stick very many times, it would cut a very precise form into the stick. And the form that is cut into the stick looks like this. I guess we all know what, uh, what a screw is. Um, 
this is actually where the idea for the screw came from, so we now think. So the odd thing about this is that man sets off starting to try to make something called fire. And on the way, accidentally, he discovers an entirely different form that's very well known in nature. It's a helix. It's the form of tornadoes. It's the form of whirlpools. Indeed, it's the form of, the form of DNA. But that rises in the screw as a byproduct. He's got no idea of what he's doing, but then he's got to find a use for it. So I'm interested in the ways in which when we're trying to do certain enhancements or create new technologies, evolution is happening at the same time. You can never escape evolution. Evolution has unintended effects, unforeseen consequences, and produces emergent effects, some of them emergent machines that we don't know about. I'll return to that later. All right. So perhaps we can't guide our uh, enhancement. Um, and this is, but <clears throat> so look, one of the things that Kevin was very focused on was this idea of becoming a, becoming a cyborg and it was very much a relationship with technology, which was technology and wires and uh, uh, hardware that was embedded, inserted, and um, added to his uh, body. And the gentleman to my left, a wonderful friend and um, an inspiring individual in his own right, is Nigel Acklin, the pioneering user of the B bionic limb. And Nigel, I always invite you to panelists to come and talk about human enhancement. And there's a reason why, but is that the right reason? Uh. <laughs> Perhaps you could explain who you are, Nigel. And, and <coughs> okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not a professor or a doctor. Like you heard earlier, my first time in a university, I'm just an ordinary bloke. I'm the guy you see walking down the street going to a factory job. Um, and like billions of people, I went to work like millions of people, I got hurt. Um, I guess over a five year period, well, let's look. Between 2006, 2011, I went to six different hospitals, five different surgeons, four different injuries, three different prosthetics, <coughs> two amputations, but no partridge. I ended up with a heart attack. Um, five years on, I got to try this, uh, the b V3. It's a myoelectric prosthetic. It's not wired to my brain. It's not plugged into my nerves. It just sits there. I put it on like a glove. I charge it up at night like a phone. I take it off when I go for a shower, like my pants. It's a piece of equipment that, yes, compared to my life as an amputee, enhances me. Compared to my life as a human being 10 years back, it doesn't enhance me at all. It has its limitations. Um, I go on the human side, I'm not, the whole idea of life extension and stuff doesn't really tickle my pickles. I'd just like to see the ten and a half million people that don't have arms get access to them. Uh, the technology's here, the technology can do so much. I don't, personally, for me, I don't need anything wired into my brain. I, I do have my reservations on the basis that everything that mankind has ever invented has been abused. If I want to punch you in the head with this, it's a, something that I've decided to do. If I'm wired up to the internet and someone sitting behind me has had a bad day at work and they start hacking it, well, Luke goes to hospital, I go to prison and there's nothing I can do about it. I have a problem with that. I have a problem with the way our morals are tended to be sidelined to push technology that some people think is really necessary. Uh, so I come to bring a little bit of reality to the, the proceedings, I guess. Um, don't believe the hype. We're not as clever as we think we are. And that's, that's where I come from. And Andrew, I think your, <coughs> your perspective is particularly important because we, we get very excited, or we can get very excited when we talk about this notion of 
enhancement technology in the body. And I know you have individuals who come up to you and go, oh my God, how do I, how do I get one? And you go, well, look, it's gonna cost you an arm or a leg and it's an or exclusive both. club. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I think it's important to have the voice of an individual who is living with technology as part of their being. Yeah, I mean, you know, Kevin had his, his chips in and, and such. I've not met anyone yet who said, chop my arm off, give me a prosthetic. People don't do that. We don't give up fully functioning, fully working limbs just to get something that looks a bit flash. This is a necessary evil. I didn't ask for this. But I'll use it and I'll try and forward it and I'll try and explain to people. I don't tell anyone anything because you're all smarter than me. I'll just drop a few dots and let you join them up. You know, I, I try to explain that the idea of being wired to a computer to control a robot arm across the other side of the world sounds great. Until you wire it up to a special forces soldier and have him controlling a missile system on the other side of the world, or until you stick it into a 65-year-old lady's head and get her flying a combat mission in an F-16 flight simulator, what is the point? If you're going to use the technology, use it for good, but we don't. Humans, we, have, we abuse stuff. We're like, we're like a virus ourselves. So I, 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 I like to bring the humanity and the moral side of it and maybe get asked people to stop for a second or two and, and smell the flowers. Maybe put your phone down, look at the sky, stop tweeting for a second or two. It's a great world we live in. The hashtag is Warwick F-O-I. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so look, there, there are some ethical questions that we're going to have to ask about the sort of societies we may live in if technology becomes more and more part of the body and, and the individual who's been looking specifically at those sort of new societies and the, the change that could occur in politics and, and culture is um, the gentleman to my far right, Professor Steve Fuller, who's Auguste Comte, Professor of Sociology here at the University of Warwick. And I know, Steve, you have um, very specific views around um, an enhancement agenda as it stands right now and the way, ways in which culture and society is set up perhaps not for an enhancement agenda? Well, I think, I mean, to pick up on some of the threads that have already been launched, uh, one of the things that's very striking about the enhancement agenda is that enhancement tends to be in terms of single dimensions of the human being. So with Andy, for example, right, if we're talking about athletes and so forth, the way in which they get enhanced is according to certain kinds of physical dimensions. And in a sense, the way in which we've traditionally thought about human beings, uh, there's actually been certain kinds of constraints that have been operative on us. You know, in other words, the fact that we haven't been able to do everything to the greatest possible extent has been part of what's defined us as human beings. And once you let any kind of dimension, let, let's say a physical dimension, to sort of become unlimited in a certain way, or an intellectual dimension to become unlimited, there's a potential for a kind of imbalance to take place in the person. And so, in a way, it's, you know, one might say, perhaps it's not by accident that we have Lance Armstrong and Oscar Pistorius, right, who in a sense are these very enhanced guys, but if you look at where they are, you know, from a sort of social moral standpoint, there's a lot of questions to be asked. And maybe that's not an accidental connection, okay? Um, and now, if you go to the point that uh, Nigel was just making uh, about, you know, he's never run across anyone who's ever asked to have their, you know, arm chopped off to get a prosthetic. Well, actually, that's not necessarily true, okay? I mean, one of the things that's kind of interesting, there's a, there was a, a report put out by the Brookings Institution in Washington last year called Our Cyborg Future, and one of the things that it argues is that there is a kind of a glamorization, you might say, of the kind of cyborg world, right? So the point is, you might have a prosthetic that, that, whose official purpose is to restore you to a certain kind of ability to, you know, to move your hand. But of course, as these prosthetic people, the people who design prosthetics become more clever and more adventurous, they put other things into it. Right? And, and in, a, in a way, what you're talking about now is getting a kind of new sort of limb that does things your old limb would not have been able to do, and maybe there's a trade-off that's worth having, especially if you've seen a, a Hollywood film where you've got some characters that are able to do this. Okay? 
And so uh, one of the things that, um, that this report talks about is the extent to which the idea of restoring to normal, right, which is kind of where you're coming from, gets kind of blurred and lost because the possibility for what a prosthetic world can give you right, ends up taking you to, into a whole new space of what it can be to, to, to live a human existence. And so the, you know, people might say, I prefer this other kind of world, even if it means giving up something that comes from my biological body. And I think that the, the, the real kind of ultimate point of all this, of these developments, is that we're really creating a kind of unprecedented level of value plurality, right? People are valuing different things on what it means to be a human being. The kind of norms that in the past people could more or less agree on where we could talk about restoring somebody to health, restoring someone to normal, and think about prosthetics purely in that way, or think about medicine purely in that way, those days are gone, okay? Uh, there is no real normal, and, and the kinds of technologies that we're gonna be talking about here explode this notion even more. And so then the question for society becomes, to what extent can we live with this value plurality? Where there will be some people who will just want to be humanity 1.0. They'll just want to be normal normal, right? They won't want to be enhanced or anything like that. Can they actually survive in a world where you have a whole no other bunch of people, maybe of the younger generation who spend their whole lives in front of Hollywood films thinking, yeah, let's, it's cool. Um, one person in the audience here, Emily Whitaker and I, spent this morning uh, interviewing young kids at the Discovery Zone here at Butterworth Hall, uh, and we were asking the kids how they thought about the future. And there were quite a few of them who were more than happy to do the Kevin Warwick thing, in the sense that they were more than happy to have their human brain put into a largely mechanical robotic body. That actually spontaneously came from several kids' mouths without Kevin Warwick having to manipulate them from afar. <laughs> okay? Um, we don't know that. Well, yeah. I'm assuming that. Okay, that's true. But that was, in, that was, and these were kids who were talking about 10, 12 years old. These, these you know, okay. And, and, and these are the people who are going to be the adults, and they're the ones who have, who have been, you know, paying attention to all these films and all this other kind of cultural stuff in the cultural background. And I think that really needs to be taken into account, that we are moving into a world where what it means to be you know, uh, you know, living a good human life is really becoming pluralized. And the question is whether these different visions of the human can coexist together in one society. So moving so to this side of the room, Andy, you have a, a fairly young child who I remember seeing you give a presentation. I can't remember the festival, but little Ethan was on your lap. And one of the questions that someone was asking is, is Ethan enhanced? <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> Andy. I mean, I mean, undoubtedly, yes. Our understanding about how to educate people today is far more sophisticated than it was 200, 300 years ago. And I think we have to go back to those original ideas within philosophy of technology and think about technology not just as artifacts, not just as things, but also as a set of ideas that surround us. And it's partly... I think the, the limitations to our capacity to adapt that cause certain anxieties about change, about radical change typified by certain kinds of uh, technological artifacts. And, and where we get things wrong is to not allow that process of adaptation um, to surround us. And we think of, yes, brains in a vat or living to 500 years, which is a really challenging bit of mental break dancing, to think of life living that long. And I think we can kind of get stuck on some of those quite far-reaching aspirations that some people have and think, you know, no, let's not, let's not pursue life extension because, in fact, life lived to 500 years would be awful. But, of course, things happen incrementally, and we do live longer than we used to. We do have the capacity to allow younger lives, newborn lives, mm. to be more likely to survive than we did than they did 200 years ago. So undoubtedly, Ethan is enhanced in all sorts of ways. But where he's not, I think, um, where he doesn't cohere with this idea of, of the new generation being completely immersed in technology is that he also enjoys life without artifacts. He doesn't use an iPad very much at all. He's not bothered about it. I fly drones. The last thing he wants to do is go out and fly a drone and, and things like that. So I think, 
I think we're moving from what I call a kind of naive technological fetishism to one that's a bit more sophisticated, where we realize that, of course, life lived as a virtual future would be far impoverished if it were absent of the physical face-to-face -face contact that we enjoy. And in fact, most of the people that work in digital environments recognize that the optimal way to innovate as individuals, as communities, around even digital technology is to give a particular value to that face-to-face -face world and the physical reality. So I think this, it's a bit of a red herring to think of this as a kind of choice between a technological future where we are surrounded and immersed in technology in spite of this other world that we are presumably undervaluing. And I think that's, that's where we need to be, to understand how we adapt and how we create processes of adaptation. And just one final point before we go on. Um, the last year or so, I've been wearing Google Glass around the world and showing people this technology. And for me, it's a perfect example of a technology that isn't yet ready for people to use. So we haven't gone through the right adaptation to embrace a world of completely wearable technologies. We don't, um, we're not capable of making this part of ourselves in a way that makes sense. And many technologies are like that. We don't have that period of adaptation, and they seem quite strange to us to go about using them. But I think that with those, like evolution, you know, it doesn't happen uh, you have this sudden break of, of, of abilities and a complete transformation. It happens incrementally. And I think we often find ourselves rushing towards the future without thinking about those processes. So I think Ethan has to go through that process of adaptation. But of course, it does happen. And it happens in ways that, as a parent or someone that's not part of his generation, we fail to perceive. And that failure to perceive an individual's technological environment is also a limitation on our ability to imagine whether or not it's worth having. Firstly, I'm amazed you're still wearing Google Glass. <laughs> but why, but was, why, Luke? It was such an odd kind of blip. It was such an odd phase where there was this kind of, you'd look out at tech conferences and everyone's little eyes were lit up and everyone was kind of looking in the corner of their eye. And it disappeared almost in 12 months. Well, that, I mean, that's a, you know, an interesting point about what technology comes and goes. Of course, many things come and go. VHS recorders, no one's, I haven't used a fax machine in quite a while. There's lots of technology that comes and goes. Sometimes that period is long, sometimes it's short. My prediction is that Google Glass will come back in some other format. Um, but there are certain functionalities that were really interesting about it. So, for example, when wearing them, you could take a photograph by winking your eye. And that was really useful for certain kinds of photography. And it was also an indication of how the interface <laughs> could change. <laughs> you, you don't get that, Nigel? Oh, I get it. <laughs> so, so imagine you're cycling along down a mountainside on your, on your off-road bike, and you want to take a photograph of the landscape or a, or a video of the landscape. You can stop. You can take out your camera and photograph. Or you can tell Glass to keep recording or shake, take a photograph. And there we have a really useful function. Look at the sort of films around this sort of technology. That's where it's useful. I don't know what you had in mind when you, when you imagined me saying that, but, but there we have a clear... Probably what everyone else said in mind. Yeah. <laughs> you, you must be one of the most naive people. Are you living in a, No, that's... <laughs> <laughs> you see, it goes back to abuse. You take photographs of mountain scenes. Oh, I think, oh, well, there you go. I've got, I've got Perth's Paradise. You know, it's okay saying, well, yeah, you can take a photograph by winking your eye, but you can also hack the thing and take a photograph of you putting in your PIN number to the bank, downloading and it to a server, having someone else come in and clear you out. That can all be done because we don't, we overstep the boundary between what you should be doing as a person and what you shouldn't be doing as a person. We've lost the morality. Now it's a case of, I'm not doing anything illegal, therefore I'm all right. The fact that what you're doing is totally immoral doesn't come into the equation. If it's not legal, you don't do it. If it's legal, you do it irrespective of the consequences. Google Glass, to my opinion, it failed because it was intrusive. It was pushed on people. When you've got all these namby-pamby Californians walking around, swanning it around with the, the Google Glass, saying, oh, look what I've got, instead of actually being smart about it, they pushed it on people. And if you push, you get pushed back. Well, now, John, I know you have some very specific views on Namby Pamby Silicon Valley types. With regards to what's happening with the singularity and with the, the folks like Ray Kurzweil, if you could perhaps explain that for, for our audience. Well. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's 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 jumping tracks a bit, and mm. there there are there are threads there. Of I hope we'll we'll pick up again, particularly moral and ethical issues. You know, particularly about who gets this enhancement and what's it used for. Um, but Luke's uh, kicked me into the uh, middle of the arena with this, this. There's an idea floating around. It comes actually from about 1965, I think, in a paper um, written by someone called who, who, who's, whose name became Jack Good. He was uh, part of the team at, um, that helped uh, crack codes during the, the Second World War. And he became involved in computers. And he wrote a little paper in which he said, I think it's quite likely that within um, this century, he was wrong, uh, he, he predicted in 1965 that a computer would appear whose intellectual capacities were greater than those of a human being. And he said, well, one of the things we do with our intellectual capacities is design computers. So this computer with superhuman powers will be given the task of creating better computers, which it will do, which in turn will produce better computers yet, and the human intellect will be left far behind. And this idea has caught the imagination of uh, a number of people, and it has been uh, turned by a writer called Werner Winge into the idea of the singularity, a term borrowed from physics, to mark a, an extraordinary period and in which human beings, as it were, produce technology that transcends themselves. Now, the idea is taken so seriously that money has been poured into creating the, the university of singularity, which is alive and well and pumping out graduates uh, in, where else, Silicon Valley. And um, in its wilder manifestations, um, it, naturally enough, uh, links with, with what this day is about. The idea that somehow the genie of, of artificial, non-human intelligence, let's, let's leave artificial aside, the, the idea of mental agencies other than human or animal ones, um, which can appear and enhance themselves and will therefore have to be lived with. That idea is alive and well, and a lot of people think that it's their, their life's work to do whatever they can to make it happen. And um, I'll stop by saying that I, I was a great fan of uh, a, a series of cartoons that used to be, appear in the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, called the Biff Cartoons. I don't know if anyone's as old as I am remembering them. But one of them had a lovely um, interaction between uh, a mother and, and her son who was uh, blathering on about some postmodern nonsense. And, and uh, she said, you're not going out talking like that, are you? <laughs> and I can't help feeling that the, these, these guys who've um, become um, seriously deranged about the idea of the singularities um, well, I don't think they should be at liberty, but they are, and they're working hard in, in California. And I tip that idea into the arena. I'd, I'd be interested to know what people think about it. But I, I think it's <coughs> self-deluding <coughs> nonsense. And what... No, I, I, I'll shut up with this. What I think we should be thinking about is how this wonderful power, unpredictable, uh, you talked about un, uh, unintended consequences. I think that's one of the things that I, I find both exciting and frightening, that we've unleashed such huge powers of, of in, ingenious technology, <coughs> autonomous, and we have ideas that it will be for this or for that. But once it is loose, who knows what it's going to be used for 
and is going to, if it is in some way autonomous and able to learn, what it's going to become. And I suppose on one hand you'd be frightened, the gene is out of the bottle. On the other hand, you could be excited. I'm both. Den, should we be so precious about preserving the human? So I want to return to the Google Glass <laughs> point. What were the, did I miss the answer? Sorry, this, I'm this, like, uh, this, uh, uh, yeah, this is a, a beer conversation. But uh, no, what I mean with, is with regards to some of your work focuses very specifically on the idea that non-humans have agency. And you can have AI that may not express itself as human, but may express itself in its own ways. Should we allow for that? It seems the, the whether what John was talking about with the, the idea of uh, AI or perhaps AI becoming intelligence <coughs> augmentation, yeah. does AI have to look like the copy, i.e. does it have to look human? There's, there's a bit of a problem with definitions here, isn't there? This, a good deal of this is semantic. Um, I, indeed we, Luke and I, spent uh, most of the summer um, going around places like, uh, for example, a couple of months ago I was in New York at IBM Watson. IBM uh, have been making uh, an artificial intelligence since the 1940s, and they're really good. Silicon Valley have only been at it for about 15 years, so you can forget about them. They're way behind the game. IBM are where it's at. And what we were doing was we were trying to lecture IBM about what the intelligence means in artificial intelligence because they realized that's the bit they don't really understand. But these are the people like those guys in Silicon Valley, like Kurtzweil, who is now employed by Google as yeah. their in-house mm -hmm. kind of proselytizer yeah, philosopher. Um, it's odd to me that Kurtzweil the man who is trying to bring about as fast as possible the artificial intelligence apocalypse is at the same time one of the very people who Andy might talk about who is pushing for one of the prime qualities of human enhancement, longevity. I, the, these are people who are pouring lots of money, lots of research power into living longer. I find that very odd that the very same people who want to bring, out, bring about kind of their own obsolescence are the same people who want to live 200, 300 years. You know, how is that going to play? It doesn't seem to me quite work very well. And I want to put this in the frame again, bring it back down to evolution. Why, why would humans want to live a very long time anyway? What advantage is there for long living in evolution? You'd think long life isn't much of an advantage in evolution for humans. In evolution, what you really want to do is live very short lifespans, but breed a lot. Be very procreative. That's the thing that keeps your species going. And indeed, it's only when humans actually developed uh, capacities for communication, that is speech, language. That was the first time in the history of evolution that evolution had selected or given evolutionary advantage to a species for longevity. So why do we prize long life? We shouldn't from an evolutionary point of view. And we want to think about why that's there and why that's powering a desire for longer life. So we've jumped around different notions of um, technologies that could be defined as enhancements, whether they're prosthetic enhancements, whether they're cognitive or medical or drug-based um, enhancements, whether it's um, artificial intelligence that gives us the ability to perhaps be smarter through working with us in a form of intelligence augmentation. It feels this area is so broad and could be so muddied, especially what you're talking about with regards to the slip between where does the human sit. Steve, I want to ask you about... Well, can I just pick... Let me begin by... Because I think uh, what, what Dan has done is set up a very interesting problem. Um, I think the first point to say is that people who talk about enhancement, whether we're talking about it in the sense of you know, 
merging with the machine in the singularity, or we're talking about humans living in their biological bodies indefinitely, and I agree with you, these are two quite divergent ways of thinking about enhancement. The one thing they do have in common, and here I agree with Dan, um, is they're actually fundamentally anti-evolutionary, right? I mean, I think this is part of what you're saying. I think that needs to be put on the table. Because what I think is at stake here, and this is where the human becomes a very interesting concept, because I think actually what both of these guys, Kurzweil and, and let's say Aubrey de Grey, who wants to talk about living forever, <coughs> is these people are trying to identify some kind of, as it were, essence of the human that should be extended indefinitely, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the normal human. It could be something else. So in other words, I think what's common to all the enhancement people is that you take Homo sapiens as primarily a platform, right? A platform that can be enhanced and can be taken to some other level. And that level might be to take the human brain and put it into a machine, or maybe digitize the human brain and put it in a machine. And that's the essence of the human. The human is not the Homo sapiens, but it's this kind of intelligence thing that, as it were, first arises in humans evolutionarily, but doesn't need to remain in the Homo sapiens. It could go somewhere else. And also, what you were saying about, you know, evolution is designed to have these organisms live short lives and reproduce a lot is exactly right. No, 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 that's right. I wouldn't use the word design. Well, well okay, <laughs> okay, whatever. But in a sense, that's kind of the, the logic of evolution, you might say, is to work that way. And you're absolutely right. If we talk about living forever, then things like the whole incentive to have children and the whole aspect of reproduction as being central to a biological species starts to drop out of the equation, right? Because in a sense, you don't need the next generation to anticipate they might do something you didn't do. You now have all the time in the world to do it. So if you first don't succeed, you can keep on trying till you're 150, 300 years old and get it right. So there's no need for a next generation. So it's very profoundly anti-evolutionary in that sense. And I think what both of these point to is that there is some kind of notion of the human here both of them are going after that is in a way I would say, in my own view, I think it's a theological notion, okay? In other words, it's some kind of notion that, that the nature of the human can somehow escape the biology in a very fundamental kind of way. And, and, and that's something that everybody likes to skirt around because nobody wants to talk about, you know, the God, that we become gods and all this. But that's always lurking around the corner in all of this stuff, whether we're talking about living indefinitely or merging with the singularity. There's always this kind of covert theological, kind of a materialistic version of a theological perspective. Uh, and, and that's something I think that in a way, if we really started coming clean about where, where does the motivation for this, where does the drive for this come from, that's where I think it comes from. Andy, in your exploration, where, where do you think that drive I mean, I, comes I, from? I don't spend much time thinking about Ray Kurzweil and his aspirations for humanity. Um, I think we live in a world where people are um, brought up to value their lives to value their existence, and where the ongoing pursuit of existence is seen as a logical extension of a reasonable, of having a reasonable quality of life. In short, if you enjoy living, then you're logically committed to wanting to continue to live. No, you're and for not. as long as you can have... No, you're not. You're not committed logically to that. You might want someone else to have a chance, if you think it's so good. But why should your presence jeopardize that? Well... Overpopulation, environmental oh, I'm not problems? Sure. Over, overpopulation? What overpopulation? There's no overpopulation. No, problem. no, but don't you think there are environmental problems that could be caused if you have too many people thinking the way you do? Well, I think we're well beyond them. We're, we're well beneath that capacity. Well beyond them. Okay, well beneath so we'll them. wait a little while before but we I, have well, this. Well, I think there's no immediate problem with overpopulation. But I think that if you value your life, it's not unreasonable to want to continue living. Wouldn't you want other people's lives to continue living? If they, you think it's so bad, like, make they, it a categorical they, imperative. They, absolutely, why not? I can totally live with that as well. There's no compromise to other people living just because I exist. Well, it depends what resources you use. <laughs> but then you're into matters of distribution and governance. Yes. This is not yes. the same as the logical commitment to wanting to continue living. Well, I don't know. Well, you know, if you want to just you know, get to the age of 70 and think I've had enough and switch off, then by all means go ahead. You're not allowed to. It's illegal. Okay. <laughs> 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 well done, well done. But you, you can still do it, Nigel. Yeah, yeah you can, you still, can do still do it, and your insurance goes this void. This is being recorded, you, guy. What did you say? You're going to be... You, you, know. can, you can do it if you want. And then well, and quite you, a few people, are, suicide, well, quite a few people are, are willing to allow people to do that. So yeah, we might not allow people presently, but, but maybe we should. But quite a few people are comfortable with the idea of having assisted suicide. So I think the idea of, of um, 
of social change around that concept and logic of suicide, I think, is, is something that's still very much in flux. I don't see it as being um, inconceivable that people could have that autonomy. Um, so, so it seems to me this idea of, of life extension is predicated on the fact that we value the lives we're living. And um, you know, doctors think about, talk about aging as a disease, something that is to be eradicated. And I think this, we are, in our pursuit of eradicating age-related illnesses, we are committing to that pursuit. Um, there's nothing suspicious about that, about valuing your existence. There's nothing immoral about it. I don't see it as compromising the existence of other people um, at all. Um, you know, why shouldn't you want to keep on living? For fear of paraphrasing Freddie Mercury, uh -oh. uh, who wants to live forever? But you can't ask people that question. I mean, you know, I, I, we, I did this with Aubrey de Grey. <laughs> Sorry, just the one. <laughs> I did this with Aubrey de Grey. No, let's do it this way. Let's do it this way. Right. Who wants to live forever? Hands up. Okay. Who wants to live to a thousand years? Hands up. Who wants to live to five hundred years? Hands up. Three hundred years? Hands up. Two hundred years? Hands up. 100 years, How hands up. people have answers to these 80 questions? years. Here we have a response predicated on the norms that people recognize as being you know, the regular thing that they're, they're used to and understand. We cannot conceive of living to 200 years old. So how can we possibly make any choice about the value or disvalue of that existence? I think we can't, and we don't need to, because in fact, getting to that point where we live for 200 years will involve a considerable incremental journey towards that point. There will be no switch on moment where we say, yes, we can live to 200 years. We will have that period of adaptation. And when we get to 180, 200 won't seem that big a deal. Can I, can I just point out again? <laughs> <laughs> in, in these debates about human enhancement, it seems that people have very clear goals. Whatever those goals are, anywhere on a spectrum, let's say in the longevity thing in between 100 years and 1,000 years. And they seem to say, okay, well, as Steve says, it's profoundly anti-evolutionary to do so. It's about escaping evolution or overcoming evolution. Evolution has, a, has given us what we've got, our, you know, 70 years, give or take. It's about changing that, overcoming that, kind of escaping it. Let's say we do that, then. Let's say we achieve a 300-year lifespan for everyone. This is not an escape from evolution. Evolution carries on independently of what we do. Yeah? What we do may interact with evolution and have consequences that we can't foresee, such as, for example, as I was hinting at earlier, longevity no longer being an advantage in the landscape we're living in. We might achieve that only to discover that the very thing that we've achieved mm, mm -hmm. is our own obsolescence as a species. And then it's over anyway. Mm -hmm. So you might think of living longer as an automatic good. It could very well turn out not to be such an automatic good. That's quite possible. But then you're into a considerable projection of potential um, unforeseen consequences, mm -hmm. which is beyond my comprehension. And I think that, again, because all of this happens incrementally, you might think, well, yes, we don't want to live to 300 years because it might destabilize other kind of ecosystems and our place in the environment, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, this doesn't happen overnight. You know, so we might live to an extra five years within a 50-year period. You know? We might get an extra five years over the next half century. You know, these are long periods of time through which we are engineering life extension. They're not overnight things. That adaptation, both, I think, for the species, but also for the environment in which we live, has that potential to take place. It isn't an overnight transformation, and I don't think it's as drastic an imbalance as, as you might suggest. An in, as drastically but actually, the defenders suggest this. This is not just something we're making up. If you look at Aubrey de Grey, mm. right, once you figure out you know, issues about regenerating cells and so forth, that overnight, as it were, you, uh, you, you raise exponentially the possibilities for life expectancy once you solve one particular scientific problem. So it won't actually happen the way you say, at least the, in terms of the people who actually work on this, they imagine that once they find the secret, right, then it'll, you know, it'll immediately change from hundred to hundreds overnight. And then there'll be these social and political problems mm. right on our doorstep. 
And <laughs> it's not going to be a matter of, as, oh, as, we discover how to live five years longer, and then we discover how to live 10 years longer. That's not kind of the way they're doing the research. So the, the key word is they imagine here. In this, in this scenario. So you don't it is the them. festival of imagination. <laughs> We're done. But no, but Bingo, we can believe, leave. You don't uh, believe in that. I, I don't think we have the capacity to predict whether it's an exponential growth after a certain discovery has been made at this point. And equally, I don't expect we have the capacity to limit investment into the science that might underpin that discovery. No, fair, fair enough. And at the same time, I don't think we have... I don't think our um, disposition ought to be one of putting the brakes on the technology. Right. And so, yes, there might be people that abuse the Google Glass. There might be people that abuse technology generally and use it for ill gains. It might be that in this world of immortality, we have those people that invest into it. I and mean, I've met some of these cryonicists that are multi-millionaires investing into the possibility of coming back. But again, I suppose I have a more optimistic view of humanity, uh, where we have the capacity to limit the distribution of goods. I am optimistic that technology, whilst it may still be quite limited in how it gets distributed across society, I'm optimistic about our capacity to affect that system of governance and make it a more just world. And perhaps that's the sort of underpinning that allows a world in which immortality exists to function in a more healthy way. It's clear that at the moment there are millions of people without prosthetic limbs. We're not doing a great job. But the, the response can't be, well, you know, let's not develop the technology. It has to be, let's get involved with governance mm -hmm. and change it there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's the whole thing about people. People don't give a shit. I give a shit, Nigel. I think people here give no, a shit I about mean, things. Seriously, you know, no, come on. seriously. You know, you, you had a guy in 1600 producing a limb that he was fighting tournaments with and he was having the best time of his life with it in 1600. We went from that 200 years later, 300 years later, we went to the hook. We've stayed with the hook ever since. Piece of string and a rubber band. The technology allows us to do it. It's the attitude that we have. And I think a lot of people don't understand that when I used to walk down the street, the prosthetic that I wore had a direct effect on the people that saw me. And the reaction I got from the people that, that saw me, with whatever prosthetic it was, had a direct and very powerful effect on the way I felt as a human being. In five years, nobody, nobody ever asked to shake my hook. I've shaken probably about 30,000 hands in the last three years with this. This is acceptable technology. Google Glass wasn't acceptable. L putting your brain in a bucket and living for 10,000 years at the moment is not <laughs> acceptable. Chopping your arm off now to get one of these. In the future, yes, don't get me wrong. I reckon within the next three years, some guy, will, and it will probably be a bloke because they're stupid, <laughs> It'll be a, a, a college grade athlete. I noticed athlete. this panel. <laughs> <laughs> Some college grade athlete who will never make it other than college grade take the legs off to become a world class <clears> Olympian <throat> and earn lots of money. I think that will happen. But that's the wrong way to go. It shouldn't be that way. Well, I'm not advocating that way, you know, Nigel. But I mean, that's, that's not, the human. I, I mean, I'm basing this on my, my 57 years around people. And we evolve, we don't change. We're still the same people that we were 10,000 years ago. Someone came up with a wheel. Great idea. I've got a wheel. Someone else said, well, put two of them together. You've got transport. Someone said, hang on. I don't fancy walking. I'll sit there. You pull me. <laughs> and then someone else came along and said, better still, put some blades on the side. We'll go and chop his legs off and steal his house. That's what humans do. We but, uh, abuse everything that can be done even, for good. But even the, in the context of the disability rights movement, there's been considerable change over the last 50 yeah, years. Why, why disability? Who gives anyone the right to <coughs> dis my ability? <laughs> I do what you lot do. I do it with one hand. Who's disabled? In the great scheme of things. It's not about disability. It's about living your life. And all I say is, I don't think that everyone should be given a bionic arm or a bionic leg. I think everyone should be given a choice mm. Mm. if they so want it. Mm -hmm. Because I know loads of people who would rather have a split hook than one of these. I know loads of people who would. And that's their reason and that's their choice. And that's fine. But when I wore a hook, it killed me. But there's nothing there we're disagreeing about. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just mean, don't understand why you would want to... I'd say there's two hard things that we, we yeah. seem to be dealing with, both on this panel and as humans, and that's choice. 
mm. in different... It's, it's choice and enforcement, you know. But it sounds like it's not going to be everybody living to a thousand. People will make choices of whether they want to live to 300 or a thousand. Of course, you'll... I think someone will make a choice for you. Or people will make a choice for you. <laughs> or you'll make that choice for yourself and you'll you organize a little suicide party where your friends surprise you and stab you in the back. And, kind of cool. and there you go. Yeah. And but that's going to probably be your only way out. Perhaps. I mean, you'll know, you'll know if this longevity thing's going when your retirement age starts going up every other year. Exactly. You know, because well, you don't, don't honestly think you're going to retire at 65 but isn't there and live for 240 that, years doing your knitting or walking your dog. You ain't. You're going to be spending the next 200 years down that coal mine or wherever it was you were, extending that life, doing exactly the same as you always were because the people who make the rules won't stop you. And I think that is a good time to open yeah. it up yeah. <laughs> to the audience. Yeah. Please, what was the... Uh, I think we have a roaming mic, but I think we lost our... Shout. Yeah, so how, be a, how, how much time, just so people have a sense of... So we, we have... Uh, we're going it's to... It's 9 o'clock. It's 9 o'clock. We're probably going to go for another about 20 minutes and close up with statements, because uh, it is Friday night, and it is the University of Warwick. There is beer being drunk outside of this room, so I know that some people don't want to augment themselves, but they want to artificially stupefy themselves. So please, first question. And there's a microphone just coming down to you. <laughs> I wish I had 12 pages. Is, that, is it working? Um, I, think, um, that I don't really need It's not working. You're just talking loud. <laughs> um, so many things are coming up. We've all absorbed so much from you, and I'm really grateful for, for what you're giving us here. Um, but it's disturbing to me, these uh, repeated suggestions of the body being dispensable. Mm -hmm. um, it's disturbing that I have to upgrade my iPhone, and I have to upgrade my Mac. I'm trying to job search. I can't get online. Wi-Fi in Costas won't work with my Mac uh, laptop that I bought 12 years ago. You know, I'm so glad that I'm not... My life and my existence isn't entirely dependent upon that technology. Um, not too long ago, I was told I needed to start self-injecting my medication... It doesn't sound like a big deal. It was horrendous for me because I've been quite proud of the fact that I don't take many tablets and I look after myself. And, and I, I got over this mountain. I realised emotionally what was going on was suddenly if there was some kind of horrific holocaust or climate change kicked in over the weekend, I, I'm 100% dependent on society and I don't trust that society is going to be there for me. And I, I don't like that. It's not a comfortable feeling. So I think it's related to what's going on. Um, I'm afraid of the economics of accessibility of this technology. Um, I'm afraid of the low lifespan of technology. I'm afraid of the um, built-in deficiency deliberately. When you go into a Mac store, they will tell you how long that's going to last <laughs> for. And you can pay a bit extra to extend that for just 12 months. It, it, someone's making so much money of our dependency upon technology already. Um, sorry, it's a bit negative, isn't it? Um, so those things bother me a lot. The body becoming dispensable so rapidly and, and this un, undebated issue of dependency. Uh, but then dependency, we are. That's part of being human, is it not? We are interdependent. And a lot of us struggle with that, you know, having interdependence, being relational, having to have relationships. So that, that's all too much, so I'll pass on to someone else. But it does feel in a way that to even to talk about the notion of enhancement is a very privileged position. And you... I, I think we should keep on having people make comments yeah. and then yeah. have us at the end say yeah. something. Slides off. Uh, Two questions. Um, the first is uh, regarding, uh, it's a word which someone brought up earlier, uh, which is the word ecosystem, but in a very different context. Um, uh, clearly kind of given the fact that we're kind of all as internet users kind of tied into various ecosystems of intellectual property, whether it's Apple iTunes or Facebook or Google or whatever, is there a danger of uh, 
physical enhancements, as it were, or, or replacements uh, for various parts of ourselves, kind of ending up in the same way? Should we be, should we be open sourcing to avoid Mark Zuckerberg owning various parts of our body. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Nigel, this is a yeah. particular concern and yeah. interest that you have right now. Yeah, you have, you have, you're spot on. I mean, it should be open source. Uh, it, I have to pay for the privilege of shaking your hand. Do you have to pay to shake mine? No. You know, I have to charge this on. I'm dependent on the utility companies to be able to tie my shoelaces. That's not a good place to be. I'm a slave to industry, just to survive. Give it 24 hours, I've got a posh stick on the end of my arm. So yeah, there is a lot that can be done, but unfortunately we're living in a society now that's going more towards monetizing everything. Mm -hmm. Because we don't produce anything anymore, we just try to make a bit of money off of someone else's idea, or nick the, ble the bread off their table. That's, that's the nature of business now. We, we don't invent much, we just develop it a little bit, stick a different colored set of wheels on it and charge you a bit more for it. So, you, you know, open sourcing for, not for everything, maybe. I mean, some people say, oh, well, we need to make a living. We need to get our development costs back. But I do think there are certain parts uh, in life where it should be open source. You should be able to have access. You know, I would love to be able to change my own thumb pads. At the moment, I might have to send this off for 10 days. Well, how many of you are gonna give your phone away for 10 days? Your life would end, you know? But we're expected to give these away for 10 days so that somebody else can fit a new thumb pad rather than make it changeable so that we can do it ourselves and have our independence. So there's an awful lot of control going on with this stuff as well. You know, your money goes into a bank instead of under your pillow. It keeps you safe, but it means that they've got access to your account. That means that you're now dependent on them. You are being made to be dependent by the society we live in. You need to update your Windows phone because if you don't, you don't get a text from your granny because we've forgotten how to write letters. It's, we are put in a situation where we are becoming dependent on technology by other people. 20 years ago, you could live without a bank account. Try it now. You just can't do it. So you're right. We should be open sourcing stuff and, and taking it away from people who just want to live like parasites and make money off the back of other people's misfortunes. That's how I see it. I agree with you. Can I just add to that? Because I know it starts with desire. I, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a nut for technology. I, I, my last bit is in interactive media. I lapped it up and I love it. But I've quickly come to notice that the desire for this desirable fetishistic stuff becoming choice then becomes need, then I, for other reasons, can't afford it, and it changes overnight very quickly from becoming a choice to something that you need to function on a, on a properly basic level. I think that's alarming. Look. Well, I it's, think, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's a Dan who said once very specifically it used to be necessity is the mother of invention, but now invention breeds the necessity. So is that where we are when we think about these enhancement technologies? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's an old saw, isn't it? Um, necessity is the mother of invention. We've all heard that phrase. Um, it's truism. But examined very carefully, it doesn't really seem to work all that well. In fact, it does seem to be the other way around, that we invent new necessities as soon as we've invented something, no matter what that thing is that we've invented. If it were really true that necessity is the mother of invention, surely we would have cracked on a bit with things like cancer. So, and you're absolutely right. And I think that you, you, your emphasis is focusing around autonomy, a fear of loss of autonomy. Um, and I, I, I thought that every, everybody's sort of tiptoeing around the political issue here. Everybody's not mentioning capitalism, really, and the way in which these... We're Warwick! Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'll get my coat. Um, <laughs> it would be interesting to hypothesize how many of these technologies that we're talking about would operate in a non-capitalistic system, and whether the frailties and weaknesses of them that we're identifying and we're afraid of 
aren't to do with the technologies themselves, but to do with the particular system under which we live. But then there's the question it's, it's of whether these technologies would have been invented without a capitalist system. That's that the is, other yeah. side of the mm -hmm. question, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. that are doing research in, but it's also in growing organs, and yeah. eventually, if that works out, they will eventually be able to grow your own arm back. Um, so it's not just, you know, metal little bits with, with you know, batteries that, that they're looking into, right. but they're looking into recreating our own organs by, with the stem cell research. Right. I mean, one of the things where it's been very successful is IV infertilization. Um, so that's, that's a technology that doesn't use the kind of technology everybody thinks about you know, with the iPhones and, and what have you. So how do you, where do you place that? Like, probably, like, most interestingly, Andy and Steve, but obviously everyone. Do you want everyone. to start on this? Yeah, I mean, it's a great, it's a great point to raise um, because I think, again, we are doing a lot of imagining the system where these things would operate and imagining the political economic circumstances of many technologies that have yet to be realized. And we, we imagine that it will work in a similar way to, it, to the way it works today. So might, there might be patents associated with prosthetic limbs. There might be cell lines that are owned and patented by certain companies that have developed them. And of course, there have been quite a lot of discussion about that, whether you can have a kind of public genome that people can benefit from that isn't owned, that is a kind of open source genome, if you like. And I think that that's, um, that's part of this trajectory. And, um, and it's up to us to ensure that the world is not more unjust in a situation where those things exist. And you know, our, our, we will either, <laughs> I guess, succeed or fail on the basis of whether we manage to do that or not. Um, the point of governance is where we can intervene I think the, the technology will happen across different platforms, different environments, which could all be, which could all be commercialized, they could all be exploitative, unless we put in um, procedures, mechanisms to diminish that sort of capitalistic um, inevitability that people often see associated with technology. But you know, again, sometimes in these debates, it does come down to that optimism we have to influence things. I haven't forgotten how to write a letter. I suspect most of you, if you were given the task now, could write yourselves a letter, despite the fact that you typically would do it on a mobile phone. And so I think that, again, one might be pessimistic about humanity because it does seem that a lot is changing. Our relationships are changing. We focus more on how many birthday greetings we get on Facebook than how many birthday cards I, I, I get. Like my birthday was yesterday. I got 75 greetings on Facebook and I got three cards through the post. You know, this is the world in which we live now. And, um, and the value system gets transferred from one system to another. And I think that, again, where there is that transition period, it's unsettling, it makes us question whether we're having a better life or not, and that makes us interrogate those transformations. Um, but, you know, sit tight, get involved, and make a difference. And I think that's where we have to focus the conversation so that we don't end up in a world that is more unjust as a result of these innovations. But, but the, let me just say, I think that there have been some unfortunate semantic precedents already set about this, because we do talk about the stuff you're raising in terms of organ farms, and there's a very strong agricultural, almost industrial level agricultural mentality that's governing the way we think about how these things might be mass produced in the future. How we could mass produce organs and not just to regenerate ourselves, but to regenerate organs. And, and so we're, we're, in a sense, the framing of this, even though the technology is still in relatively infant stage, the, the, you know, the sort of metaphors and things we are using, the kind of the ideas that we're borrowing from economics to understand this in the first instance already suggests sort of mass level industrial agriculture, it seems to me. And so uh, there's, as it were, you know, there is, as it were, uh, we've already sort of already gone down a certain trajectory, even though the technology itself is still relatively infant, the, the imagination of it has go already gone down this route. And so I guess I would say that if you're concerned about this issue, namely that we're already beginning to capitalize this stuff, which I think is true, um, then you should start having a kind of alternative way of framing what all of this 
organ farming stuff is. You need another way of talking about it that doesn't actually end up implicating it you know, so automatically in the capitalist system. Because I do think that is how it's being conceptualized now in a very matter-of-fact way by the kind of the loose language we use about it. Hi, sorry. Um, so it's really interesting hearing what you're saying about um, it should be everyone's choice, it shouldn't be forced upon them. But perhaps the flip side of that then is also um, it should be available for those who do choose it. Um, it's a very obvious one, the e uh, economics of, of such a situation, um, trying to avoid, um, I suppose there's two ways of it, you know, the, the kind of idea that in, in a privileged position in a country such as ours, where perhaps you could get to a point where everyone who wants it can have it, um, in a world where you have extreme poverty and um, disadvantage, and perhaps there are technologies that are finally starting to help us claw back towards a more equal position, suddenly a technology like this sets the disadvantages back yet another step because they'll never have access um, in, in that stage of, of poverty to that kind of technology or on the flip side in society where we as a society um, in this country are, are starting to come to grips with the debate about um, actually perhaps you know a lot of people that we see as extraordinary aren't actually that extraordinary it's more an issue of opportunity mm -hmm. um, and so really it's just a social issue suddenly it becomes that the very rich can afford such incredible enhancements of themselves that they it isn't it goes back to being whereas we've just realized it's actually a social thing it goes back to being actually no they are now extraordinary because they've made themselves extraordinary so how do we like avoid these technology is being used to actually just entrench uh, a hierarchy or, or some superiority in certain people. I think um, prosthetic devices, disability aids, if that's what you want to call them, to be politically correct. Um, exosuits at the moment, within the next couple of years, there'll be more able-bodied people, if you like, wearing exosuits on a regular daily basis than there will be people who actually could do with them. That's going to be a fact. Hmm. A byproduct of that is that eventually someone in a wheelchair will be able to afford it. Same with prosthetics. Um, it will be a case of, you know, we'll make a prosthetic overhand that gives you the G.I. Joe Kung Fu grip. Superb. But eventually someone with a dead hand will be able to put that glove on and use it. It won't be made for them, it will be a byproduct of it. Mm -hmm. It's rather like putting a ramp up outside a shop. If you say, I'm going to put a wheelchair ramp up, you get some people with a bit of opposition to it. If you say, I'm going to put a ramp up there for buggies and ladies with their buggies and people with their old shopping trolleys and we'll make it a bit wider for a wheelchair user, then it becomes acceptable. It's not a disability thing. It's a people thing. So we make the stuff acceptable. Unfortunately, the way we are, yes, there are more people able-bodied in the world than there are people who aren't able-bodied. It makes sense. If you want to get products out, if you want to sell your stuff, if you want to get your development costs back, You've got to sell it to you people, and we'll get it as a byproduct at some point down the line. That's just the way it will be. You know, it might not be the right way. So uh, to your point, I mean, this is the festival of imagination, and it seems like you're arguing as much as we can imagine what we could be, does that imagination start beginning to turn back on us and we look at ourselves as already and always perhaps disabled? So, I mean, there's a, perhaps, a, a, in a broad sense, an equality in what, at uh, the very beginning of, of our lives, maybe we have the potential to become that is then shaped by our social surroundings or something like that. You know, with the opportunities that we get um, shape what we go on to, to achieve and that kind of thing. But as a, as a human being, we're, we're born relatively equal, that kind of idea, um, on the most part, because most of us have the, the capability to do basically the same as the person next to us. Um, we have a brain, we have um, um, <clears throat> the same intelligence at the starting point that is then cultivated. If we have the ability to just buy our way to a higher intelligence or buy our way to uh, faster legs or... or does this, not ex make that, does this not make that exponentially worse then? Because someone from the very earliest stages of their lives can, by their parents, be bought um, uh, implants in their brain that can make them more intelligent than someone who went to a public school. Like, Yeah, but see, this is the, this is the problem in a way. This kind of, the, what you've just touched on with the public school and, and getting the brain enhancements. Actually, in a very perverse way, a lot of people who defend enhancements actually do it and I think I may have even heard Andy kind of go for this argument a little bit. It's a kind of, you know, we already do it, right? We're already enhancing our kids by sending them to better schools because we can afford to do so. So, so why not also do the 
these other kinds of enhancements, and given that it is the capitalist system, a trickle-down effect will be exactly what Nigel's talking about. Eventually, eventually even the poor people will get it, right? Uh, and, and so, you know, why not, right? That's going to open the door, and if you just wait long enough, everyone will benefit. I mean, it's sort of trickle-down approach to technological innovation. No, I mean, I, it, there are a lot of enhancement people who will look at you with a straight face and make that argument, right? And, and, and I, but, but I think that the point you were beginning with is, is a very serious point, namely, all this stuff that we're talking about here about enhancement, one of the problems is it's, it doesn't really have a high enough political salience yet. In other words, the sort of people who are thinking about designing the National Health Service or designing our education system or, or our welfare services, this stuff is not sufficiently on the radar yet for them to worry about it as a problem of social justice. Right? We're thinking about it, we're worrying about this, but until the policy makers kind of put this on their agenda, you know, and some people, you know, some people associated with this is, are trying to do that, but that's when you're going to start to get people giving you serious answers to the questions you're asking, once it becomes politically salient in some way, and maybe that will have to take a kind of step change in this technology that we keep on saying is going to be around the corner. You know, once you do come up with some really good brain-enhancing thing and a few rich people do it and they end up having marvelous results, then politicians will say, like, shit, we're going to have to make this available to everyone, otherwise we're just going to increase the inequalities that are already here. Just going to have to make it taxable first. Yes, taxable, I know, I know, and that's, oh my god, yes, that's a problem. <laughs> There's been an individual here patiently waiting to ask a question. Um, yeah, with um, so much data accumulating in the, in the cloud, in the internet, um, from each individual, and for the next generation, that will be pretty much from birth. Um, does the panel think that there might be some potential in the future for people's data to be so smart <laughs> up there in the cloud that it's almost more that person than the human down here on Earth? Yes. You know, that you could almost ask questions of your data and, and get told what the real you would, would really prefer in a certain circumstance, or even that that data could be used to power a a sort of robotic version of you that, that came down from the cloud. Like, do you have any thoughts on that sort of area? I, th I think it's an issue of metaphor. The, the idea that the brain is hardware and whatever mind is is software and we can kind of upload it and send it out into the world to kind of do things for us. I think it's a very easy narrative to, to perhaps find attractive because it kind of feels like our social media is us. But then you have to look at the babies and the dead people and uh, Andy, when Ethan was born, you were oversharing Ethan. There was a, there was a project. No, but look, if, if we're to take it seriously, how much data makes a human? How much data does there have to be in these online environments for it to have some sort of relationship to us that is, is back and forth? And there was a project called Kickbee. And Kickbee is an elastic band that pregnant women wear. And every time a baby kicks, it sends a notification to Twitter. <laughs> But that's not the weird thing. The weird thing is it sends the notification to the baby's Twitter account. Ah. Uh. And it sends it in the first person. I just kicked mummy at 12.58 p.m. LOL. <laughs> yeah? So even before you're Andy born... Andy does have that, actually. But even <laughs> Andy before you have that. Yeah. <laughs> well, almost, Ethan has his I'll own Twitter that. account, yeah, which does. is subjectively edited by his parents. Now, my question for you, Andy, is like, when, when's the digital bar mitzvah for Ethan? Where you, kinda, where you go, look, here's all the passwords to your social accounts. Go forth and explore how I've fucked up your life by oversharing. <laughs> You know, on the flip side of that is what happens to the dead I, people I, when I, all that digital detritus about us is out there. You know, what are my ancestors going to find about me? There's going to be a lot of pictures of me at Warwick at 18, like falling out of the duck and other bars. But that's... I wish we had the capacity to understand how a five-year-old today would feel about their digital identity 13 years from now, or 14 years from now, whatever it might be. I don't think we do, because none of us grew up in that world. But certainly some things are different. The um, sensitivity to being on cameras changing, certainly we are, young children are much more exposed to being on screens. They live in a multi-screen environment. So there are many things about their upbringing that are different, that are likely to change their views about privacy, about safety, about security, and about communication generally. Um, I hope uh, Ethan will feel comfortable with himself and confident enough and less anxious about things like having data out there than some of us seem to be. 
Um, but I think that there is, I think the, you know, it's a very interesting question about whether the cloud knows more about us than, not, <laughs> than, than we do. And it's hard to think of in abstract terms, but if you think of a, you know, a simple example, and this is actually not, not a very good example, but you know, every time I go to London, I forget which hotel is affordable and decent. But conceivably, this is, a, this is information that is out there in the cloud. You know, I've rated a hotel, I liked it. The cloud could tell me which hotel I'd like to book again, because I always forget. And so conceivably, that data can lead to decisions that we are more likely to make that resonate with the sort of life we want to lead, because in fact, we become much more comfortable with forgetting certain information now. We don't retain it in the way that perhaps we used to, perhaps because we focus on other information, other stimulus, and we just don't worry about these other things. Um, but I think that that's where um, the challenge of, of what is our identity is also uh, quite difficult to reconcile, because that identity changes. If we aren't remembering the things that we used to remember, like your telephone number um, or postcodes, I think that our minds are freed up to fill that space with other things that may matter to us more. Others might say we're losing the abilities, but I, I don't think we are. Until someone takes your phone away. Take it away. <laughs> we will not die by not having our mobile phones. It's completely absurd that, to, to make that argument. We might feel a certain difference to our communica uh, communications with each other, but we will not die by not having a mobile phone, yeah, Nigel. How many people, there are people going to therapy now. There are therapy classes lined up for iPhone users. The average iPhone user looks at his phone 150 times a day. I look at mine 150 times a month, maybe, but only if I phoned it to find out where it is. <laughs> right. It's, it's one of those things. <laughs> you know, the, the whole idea, you say, you know, th the next generation, they'll have a whole different view of privacy. Yeah, they, they do have a very... And they do. Yeah. But do you not think that, that society was built effectively on secrets? You have a secret, you want to share it, it's burning you up, you want to get it out, I'll find someone I trust. I'll tell this person my secret. Then you've got the buildings of society. They were built on trust and built on how you can pass something. If you've got no trust, if you've got no privacy, you've got no one to trust. If you've got no one to trust, it's an all-out-for-yourself society. If I it's an all-out-for-yourself society, would you want to live in that? I know plenty of people that are more mistrustful of people that don't have a digital footprint than people that are worried about it. If you have no presence online, people wonder, why not? Why aren't you online? Like, what are you hiding? <laughs> it's, you know, people think about digital presence as a way of enabling trust, not as a way of jeopardizing it. So we have time for perhaps one more question, and I'm going to ask the panelists to, to have a minute to give their message to the audience of what they think they should do to go forward and maybe extend this debate or conversation around human enhancement. So think on that minute while we take this gentleman's question. OK. Um, one of the things which uh, Steve said earlier was that um, he he asked uh, some 10-year-olds coming out of Butterworth Hall as to whether they would accept to be kind of enhanced. Um, I would argue that um, one of the reasons why they said yes was because they were 10 and they, you know, they, they, and they, they, they might have found it quite kind of just exciting without thinking as, as deeply and as aware of the issues as we have here tonight. So I, I guess my, my, my question is, um, how much of, of, of this, co these concepts are kind of related to utility value? In other words, you know, exactly as kind of Nigel is demonstrating, a physical need for, for enhancement. How much is beyond that? So the, the, so the kind of visual enhancement, the glamour side of things, and going back to what you were saying earlier about kind of, you know, actually removing a limb to kind of have... Have a, have a better one on? And, and are we already beyond the point where we haven't yet made our minds up as in society between utility and glamour? Well, if, if, I, if I may say, I mean, I think, I think you should take those 10-year-olds reasonably seriously uh, along the lines of the sort of things that, that Andy's been saying about the generational shift on issues like privacy and things like that. I think that's real. I think what Andy is saying there is real, and it has to do with this kind of regular exposure. You think about the kind of world that they're living in and what is their culture effectively, which is different from the sort of adult world, right? And, and that world is becoming more of the, the actual world. 
And, and so I do think once, you know, once these people become adults, a lot of those same attitudes that, you, that you, we saw in the 10, 12-year-olds will remain. I think, and I think Andy, in, in pointing this out, is actually quite right. I, the problem is we don't really, our sociology hasn't caught up with this. Mm -hmm. This is the main problem, right? The sociology is not caught up with this kind of new world that we're entering into now. But I do think, uh, I do think he's right, right? That, that, that you know, people are more, younger people are more comfortable about privacy. The, you know, the issue, you know, we trust people who have the presence online, not the ones who don't have presence online. I mean, all of that, I think, I think that fits. But we just don't have a sociology to kind of normalize that because our sociology is still very much rooted in the pre-digital world. Mm -hmm. I think that's fairly, fairly clear to say. And that's where there is a kind of challenge for us as educators, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. I would perhaps agree with you in part uh, because 10 year olds are more exposed to imagery around. I mean, when I was a kid, my, my cartoons were anthropomorphic talking bunnies. Now these, now these children are growing up with Pokemon, which is a big advert for chimeras, essentially, like these mashed up weird biotech creatures and Astro Boy, who has rockets for feet, these Japanese and Asian imported cartoons are making people more aware of these kind of visual cues of what it means to be enhanced. And all you have to do is look at the difference between, say, The Matrix in 1999 to Avatar in 2009, two very different narratives around transcendence. One which is the human is just plugged into a machine and everything is very <coughs> machinic. And then fast forward only 10 years to 2009 and we have this narrative of a human transcending themselves by essentially plugging themselves into a big blue piece of biotech. It, it went from the very kind of cyber-cultural narrative to a very biotech narrative. But I'm very conscious of time, and I would like to ask the panelists to share perhaps a minute of how they think an audience, such as the audience that's gathered today, because clearly to come on a Friday night to the University of Warwick, to the Festival of Imagination, you are, I would hope, interested in this subject. But I'd like to ask the panel just a minute of how you'd like the audience to take this debate forward and, and perhaps um, any closing statements you have. You have about a minute each and I'd like to start with Andy, if that's okay. I think we have to start with those social concerns uh, that, that have come out in a lot of this discussion. We have to recognize also that people have very individualistic journeys through technology. We don't all feel the same way about our experience on Facebook or Twitter. Um, and I think that the complexity of those multiple configurations makes it very hard to kind of get to a point where you say, you know, we should slow down with the technology, we shouldn't innovate, because in fact, every individual journey is different. I think in many respects, society doesn't change a great deal in some of those core values that we have, but we can do a lot more to transform those injustices that operate around present day and near future technologies. So, I'm less worried about a world in which people wish to pursue living for longer, whether it's 20 years longer or 200 years longer, as long as along the way we are vigilant of those issues that relate to social justice. I think that's where we do have the capacity to change it. The open source system is a new technological system. So if that's the one we want to embrace and get away from this other one that we hate, which is locked down with IP rights and patents and everything, then that's the route we go down. Uh, but it is still a technological system. Nigel. Yeah, I mean, I go along with the open source thing. I, 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 still, I still think we're blindly being pushed into a world where, you know, we could, we, could have pretty, we could have good lives, but we could also have pretty bad lives. And it's down to the people who are at the top. And it's, you say, you know, we should make sure that we're aware of the stuff that could go on in the future, but it's happening now. As soon as you sign up on a Facebook account, you give them permission to actively, actively probe your security settings. You give them permission to hack your phone, to hack your passwords, because you want to go on Facebook and chat to your Aunt Sally in Australia. That's what needs to be addressed. The rest of it is fine. It's that that needs to be addressed. The fact that if I want to ask you a question on your Contact Us page, why do I need to give you my name, address, phone number, email address, and age? I want to ask you a question. I had this. I wanted to ask. I had to give so much information about me, not because they wanted it, but because they could sell it. 
And that's the problem, because I walked into the department store three days later, I walked up to a guy and said, have you got such and such? Yes, mate. Cost me nothing, I gave nothing away. He doesn't know me from Adam. And that's the way it should be, unless I choose. If I have a photograph on my phone, it stays on my phone. It's not for everyone in the world to see, unless I choose to show it. Unfortunately, we don't live in that society. And I think we need to be getting some of that back instead of being able to just be there and as soon as you sign up to something, someone's just made 50 quid off your name. That's wrong. And we need to get that back and then we'll have a reasonably good framework to move on with technology. Technology that is trusted. And that's, that's the thing. I think the, the ulterior motive behind technology is, is just, at the moment, is, is money. Money and power for a certain few individuals. So all I would say is keep your eyes open and if you don't like something, say something about it. You know, do be aware. Your liberties are being eroded very slowly from here and there and everywhere else. And by the time you realise what's going on, it'll be too late. That's coming from my heart. Dan, uh, it's Friday night. Keep it light, please. <laughs> keep it light. Okay, I'll keep it pragmatic. Wrong person. Yes. I'll keep it pragmatic as well. Please keep it pragmatic. Really responding to Nigel, who voices this very eloquently, but also something I feel from facial expressions and gestures being made in the audience. Um, <laughs> one of the things that you're worried about is the relation of inequality to technology. And will technology be used to answer inequality, or will it merely increase inequality? And I'd say this, over the past 50 years, 60 years, 70 years now since, Harold Wilson, uh, the Labour Prime Minister's uh, white heat of technology speech in the 1960s, the left wing, to be explicitly political, has been very bad at talking about technology. Conservative governments, capitalistic governments, Republicans in the US, are very good at talking about technology. It's very good, very easy to talk about technology from a position of power and wealth, and I already have everything. The interesting thing is, um, I met a couple of guys recently. They're very young. Um, they're just graduating from LSE. One of them just got his doctorate. Influenced by the conferences that were here, Virtual Futures, 20 years ago, they were reading the people who were there, who were here back then, the people who were in the philosophy department, and they've started a kind of intellectual movement. It's called accelerationism. And what they're interested in is how do we, uh, we, they, as leftist thinkers, I, as people who are not thinking, in terms of capitalism or right-wing thinking, but whose concerns are social and to do with equality. How do we regain the possibility to talk about technology? And if you're interested, I, and again, I, I was just going by kind of things that people shook their heads at, but if you're interested in that politically, then accelerationism is a thing that you should probably look up. There's a manifesto. John. I hear some a lot of anxiety from the remarks uh, made, and I would reassure you that if you look at what uh, actually happens, and then you look at what was predicted was going to happen 10 years before, um, it's always less, and it's, it, it sort of recedes as people approach it. It's fun to think about these things, and it's fun to think what would happen if this bit of technology or that bit of technology uh, could be made to do that. Um, but it's, it's, it's more science fiction than anything that you would need to be worried about. And that particular thing about your identity somehow appearing because a large amount of information about you accumulates somewhere in the cloud and somehow becomes you... No, don't worry about it. <laughs> it's, you know, you're still you. Minds come with bodies. And this notion of, of disembodiment, 
or of piecemeal taking to part, taking to, to analyzing apart the uh, components of an individual and making them exist independent, independently. Um, I'm, I'm simply a, a bio bigot. I don't think it's <laughs> going to happen. It, it, it can't happen. Uh, so a lot of things that might seem worrying, don't worry, don't panic. Um, keep calm and um, <laughs> carry on. Keep, keep avoiding technology. I mean, here's an example of someone who um, I live quite happily without um, iPhones or, or anything of that sort. I have a mobile, but I use it, you know, once every couple of weeks. That's all, and uh, I have a reasonable life. And a Warwick University library coming, which is... Warwick University... What gives you a reasonable life, University of Warwick? Yes, <laughs> Warwick University has a lot more to do um, to mm -hmm. uh, act on the things we've, we've heard today. I think we live a very privileged lifestyle, and that's what I'm doing in my department. I'm trying to stir up as much trouble as possible <laughs> to, to make, them make them aware of, of just how little Warwick is doing. Um, to really address some of these questions and how much it's doing, just to keep everything on its usual capitalistic rails. And this may be John's last <laughs> <laughs> public speaking event. Are you listening, my Nigel? <laughs> <laughs> he was and, here, you know, he was here this and, and, and somebody else who's trying to engineer his own obsolescence at this university, <laughs> Professor Steve Fuller, hey. I almost well, I mean, yeah, giving you the final word. Well, but. I, I think one thing, to go back to what Nigel was raising, because uh, I mean, one of the reasons why, see, cap this is this is a crisis of capitalism that, in a sense, you're alluding to, because as the price of everything just drops as our technology gets better in the industrial side of things, how are capitalists going to be making money in the future? The only way is going to be through information. I mean, this is the the, the one thing that is left to exploit that isn't going to dec decline in value is going to be this data, right? And, and so there is a sense in which this kind of increasing surveillance that we are forced to kind of get ourselves involved with is actually kind of something that is forced upon the capitalists themselves as a result of the way the system has been working. So, you know, I've, I've been writing recently about this idea of what a Marx 2.0 would be addressing now. And it seems to me this is the kind of exploitation that Marx would be addressing. Uh, you know, not the technological unemployment stuff that a lot of Marxists talk about, but this business of the exploitation that comes every time you're in front of a screen and you have to mm -hmm. provide all kinds of information in order to get anything, and the only way you can get anything is through the computer screen. And, and, and I do think, you know, for, you know, for someone thinking about how you're going to reinvent Marx and the capitalism of the future, this is kind of the first place to start to look at exploitation. And it's part of this uh, other kind of phenomenon that I would say keep your eye on, and that is the blurring of work, play, and leisure, which, which is because all of it is coming through the computer, right? And, and, and at one level, this seems like a really good thing, right? We don't even need to leave our homes anymore, right? We can be working and playing and everything in front of the computer and kind of seg in and out of all of these things. But these are also the arenas in which exploitation are taking place in a very kind of unconscious way. The toddlers are doing it. I've, I've seen mothers with toddlers. The toddlers are doing it. <laughs> the, mother, the mothers are beside themselves at PTA meetings because their toddlers run up a massive bill on the ball site because they're giving the child a child it's a toy to the child. Right. Yeah, well, this is, this is, this, so I think this is the kind of, you know, you got to keep your eye on this ball because it's being packaged in a very attractive way, right? Um, but at the same time, and often being uh, packaged in a way that makes it look like your life is becoming more holistic because you're sort of doing everything through the computer and you don't actually have to split yourself off in many different ways. But in fact, it's becoming a kind of site of exploitation. And so I do think, you know, in terms of how one, you know, because there is an issue, and, and you know, the, acceler the, the accelerationists are kind of an interesting kind of, the idea of trying to find a kind of critical angle on this that is not just going to be the old sense of critical theory, but a kind of critical angle that actually would have some purchase in the kind of world that we're moving into. And, and so I think that's kind of, you know, for people who do want to, you know, be critical, you can't just repeat kind of the Marxist style arguments against industrial capitalism. You have to think about what kind of capitalism we're entering into now and what's the appropriate critical theory for that. So on that note, <laughs> you're either here for work, play, <laughs> leisure, or maybe all three, but I want to thank you 
for coming on a Friday night to the Festival of Imagination. We use the word imagination or imagine about seven times, so we've filled our rota. Um, so look, the key thing I think we've taken away from is beware of people wearing Google Glass who <laughs> wink at you. And on that note, please welcome or thank my wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.